The year is 1940 and productions at RKO for another B-movie have just wrapped up. Nothing out of the ordinary. RKO were known for these of course, placing an amplified focus on ambitious exploitation flicks under the helm of then producer Lee Marcus. But even he probably didn't expect a movie this special. The talk is of Stranger on the Third Floor, the unofficial start to the film noir movement. A reporter achieves his big break by virtue of his testimony helping in sentencing a man to death. Are you absolutely positive he's the same man? I am. He never actually sees the murder play out though, and by worried suggestion of his girlfriend Jane, I didn't kill him! I didn't! I didn't! Doubt begins to unfurl. After all, I didn't see Briggs actually kill Nick. Well, the rest of the evidence was circumstantial too. Doubt turns into paranoia. He didn't hear me. Paranoia to nightmare. Sleep. Wake up. Why did you do it? Nightmare to reality. And suddenly, he's the culprit for another murder. There are certain similarities between the two crimes, but you missed one, perhaps the most important. Both murders were discovered by the same man. You. But I didn't kill him. There's a throat-slashing madman on the loose, and Jane goes on the hunt for him. The narrative is lean enough to feature on a napkin, but narrative was never the main selling point here, and yet, it still manages to paint a bleak picture of the US, one that single-handedly exposes the American dream as a literal nightmare, where one can only move ahead by putting others down. Funny part of it is, she acts as if I were personally responsible for the whole thing. Well, maybe you are. After all, if you hadn't seen him, he'd never been caught. A world where judges fall asleep during pivotal hearings, where corruption dominates, where crime is only stopped accidentally. It's an incredibly dark worldview, which is probably why audiences and critics at the time were not too fond of it, calling it both pretentious and boring, causing it to flop at the box office. So like any other good B-movie, a stranger on the third floor would embark on a journey into deep obscurity before being rediscovered decades later. But why? Compared to most other films of 1940, there's a night and day difference to how stylish Stranger on the Third Floor looks, predating the noir style of the following decade with its oblique angles, experimental lighting and skewed framing. Okay, kid! Go and die! What a gloomy dump. Why can't they put in a bigger lamp? Its small scale locations, all of which are dripping with Chiara's chorus, set the tone for Mike's abyssal journey into insanity. No, or oh, while the paranoid nightmare sequence that follows it is analogous to something Lang, Murnau or Wiener would have done in Germany 15 years prior. There's an undeniable amount of talent at the helm of this tiny B picture. Cinematographer Nick Musaraka, who the previous year played understudy to Karl Freund, would establish himself as one of the visual voices of noir shooting masterpieces like Out of the Past and The Locket, alongside the similarly eerie horror films I Walk With a Zombie and The Spiral Staircase. Set designer Van Ness Polglas, with whom Musaraka shows great chemistry during the aforementioned nightmare sequence, in which spacious establishing shots of an imaginary cell without bars are intercut with sweaty close-ups, would later go on to feature in RKO's biggest ever film, designing these sets of masterpiece Citizen Kane. But its main star, of course... No, now. Now! Right now! 
I want to ask my questions now and, and I want to have my answers now. You hear? The ominous stranger, the embodiment of an archaic, scrupulous Europe, coming over to endanger and ruin the streets of the US. Though eternally typecast, Laurie would also be a defining figure in cinema's history, shaping both crime and horror with his sinister blending of the two, always to a point where one doesn't quite know which genre he's watching. I caught it. I caught it. Stranger on the Third Floor is a B movie. There's no doubt about that. And it's unlikely to have had any major impact on following films. But it marks the first time the streets and minds of the US were photographed with such shadowy existentialist guilt. One which would reign supreme over theaters across the nation for the following decades. I told you not to drink coffee before going to bed. 